last week I spoke about Buber and this week about Rosenzweig. The two go hand in hand because they disagreed on everything and yet they were in partnership on so very much. Uh, and so I have here, this is a photograph of Franz Rosenzweig. You can see very, very yekish look, right? German, Germanic look, the spectacles, trim mustache. Um, so very much the uh, opposite image of, of, of a Buber, as you can see, who looks like an old Hasidic rabbi. And of course he was infatuated with Hasidism. The difference was the Buber never lived a minute as a Hasidic Jew. He didn't like it, he didn't want it, but he, he was a fan of Hasidism, right? The ultimate, uh, because he was too much of an anarchist. So here he is looking like a Hasidic Jew <clears throat> and Rosenzweig, his colleague, looking very much like the ultimate Yeke, the ultimate German, and yet he is very much the Jewish one in terms of Jewish observance and, and Jewish lifestyle. So I won't go too much into his philosophy. I, I found a beautiful video that explains his philosophy. It's very, very difficult, very deep. It is, well, that's what you expect out of uh, the, the, the intellectuals, European intellectuals. Uh, Americans <clears throat> generally don't have a capacity or interest in this kind of thinking. But what's his significance? <clears throat> for us? He ranks as one of the most original Jewish thinkers of the modern period. Not that many people know about him. You know, stories about him going to shul on Yom Kippur, but what else do we know about him? The total renewal of thinking, new thinking. It was, from his perspective, a way to break the impasse between philosophical realism and science and this vision of the world that one sees through religion. So his call of revelation is a call from the absolute, and it becomes something helps shape Jewish and Christian theology together and has its impact on 20th century existentialism. I don't know if it's as big as it used to be, but existentialism was the thing, the thing in the 50s, 60s, and still influences the way we think today. The idea of dialogue, similar to Buber, about the relationship between an I and a thou, uh, very important in his thinking as well. The idea of the translation of the Bible into German once again, but a German that would reflect the actual nuance of the Bible that he did together with Buber. And then the creation of a center for adult Jewish education, Frankfurt de Lernhaus, which shaped Jewish education in the following century everywhere. So very important points. He came from a very assimilated background. He almost converted to Christianity. It's that almost conversion that made him a Jew again. Uh, he did all of his philosophical work on postcards that he sent back home during, from the front lines in World War I. He was a promising intellectual philosopher of his day. He left his academic career in order to lead and teach in the Frankfurt Jewish community. All of this he did, especially in his last years, while he was suffering from paralysis of ALS syndrome, and he was basically dying as he's writing his very last thoughts. <clears throat> and he's famous for his great work on Jewish philosophy, the greatest work of modern Jewish philosophy, Star of Redemption, where you have a systemic, systematic philosophy, rather than ideas of philosophy or, or answering to questions raised by philosophy. All right, well, we're going to look at it. First thing that's very dramatic about him is his conversion almost to Christianity and back to Judaism. Oh, we'll see. Oh, so here's the story. He, he had a cousin, uh, Rudolf Ehrenberg, and his best friend Rosenstock. They both were, the cousin was Christian, baptized at age 11. Rosenstock, a major Christian philosopher, young philosopher, up and coming of his day spent the time with them and felt that he was on the verge of abandoning his very existence as a Jew, almost wanted to commit suicide. He says, he writes in his way, he had a pistol in his hand faced with nothing. So he was determined then to convert to Christianity, thereby to take his place in the historical realization of redemption of the world. He felt that was the way that the world would be intellectually that it was through Christianity that the intellect of the world was being presented. And so he tells his parents, we are Christians in all things. We live in a Christian state. We go to Christian schools. We read Christian books. Our whole culture is based on a Christian foundation. So if that's the case, might as well be a Christian. That was very, very popular. He's a young adult. He's about 20-something. 
So everything, like all Jews, if everything is Christian, this was very common. The end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. Might as well. There's no big difference anymore. The Christianity that we know it is watered down. It's not the medieval Christianity of the church. It's even more liberal than Protestant and Lutheran. So might as well. That's civilization. But then he said, well, but wait a minute. If I'm going to be baptized, then wait, I, I'm not a goy. He says, I'm a Jew. I have to come to Christianity as a Jew. What is Judaism then? I have to find out. So it is said that he decided to postpone his going to the baptism font. We're not sure exactly, but tradition has it, the reports have it, that he went during the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, began to say, well, what is it to be a Jew? And it is said that he went to a synagogue. This is the report, the simple synagogue, small synagogue, not the fancy big synagogues that were popular with the organ and the choir and the service more in German than Hebrew. And I'm sure they had no idea what was going on because they had a very poor Jewish background and upbringing. And something in that switched him. And so he comes back to his cousin and to his friend. He says, we agree, true, for you Christians, no one comes through the Father but through him, through the Son. Jesus, yes, for you Christians, true. But I just realized I don't have to come through the Son because I'm already there. I'm part of the people of Israel. I didn't need this intermediary. As a Jew, I'm there with God. And so he began to explore his Jewishness, began to explore Jewish sources, began to explore Jewish observance. Not that he became completely orthodox, but more traditional. So someone asked him, are you putting on tefillin? His answer is not yet. There's nothing would be a barrier. He would not let any part of Jewish observance become an ultimate barrier. He wasn't always doing everything, but he was in the process of. So he begins... Yeah. He didn't know exactly. That's it. So now this is exactly where this is where every Jew was. That's right. This is where every Jew was in Europe a century ago. Nowhere. This is where 90% of American Jews are. Garnished. No, nothing. Today. Okay, but what happened? Now watch what happened in Germany. Very, uh, 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 he catalyzed a return to Jewish identity, maybe more than anybody else. It's not that the German Jews entirely were washed out, uh, verteicht uh, completely, but uh, it was a washed out, you know, uh, what can I say, bleached Judaism, cleansed and bleached for public use. So he begins to dispute with Buber on Buber's theology. Buber's talking about God, finding God in the relationship with the human being, and he disputes that. He says, it's much deeper than that. I'm not going to go into it. He talks about revelation. You actually have a feeling of God before you even get to the other human being. He's writing all this as, say, postcards that he sends back from the battlefront, World War I. Uh, and this, though he disputes with Buber, they become very good friends. Um, and he creates a translation uh, of uh, Buber, uh, of the Bible with Buber. All right, let's just go ahead. Some highlights of his new thinking. Uh, I'm just going to say these, and I, I have a video actually. I'm going to put it on the video. It's very interesting. The video is made by the philosophy department at the Catholic University of Portugal. Very interesting, because as Catholics, he provides a defense of religion against modernity, a, a reasoned defense, a strong defense. And so they, although he's saying you don't need Christianity to be there, they find it very important. So they, I, I have this video. I'll, I'll, I'll put on the video. Uh, we talk about his importance in existentialism. Existentialism, uh, it is rather, we don't need to know the essence of why something is. We just know it is. And what is, is where we start from. I assume being why I am as I am, it's not important, it's the fact that I am, I see, I observe, uh, I relate, that's where the core of everything is. Okay, so the big thing, right? He starts to draw people around him, other Jews, because he's writing about why it's important to be a Jew, how a Jew has an answer for 
Western civilization or human civilization. Then we go back, 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 back. So it says it comes from knowledge. We Jews know nothing. So we're going to establish not the Heder, not the yeshiva, but Friar Yiddish Lehrhaus, the free Jewish school. Now think of what this does. This is Frankfurt. Frankfurt is the center. By the way, everything that you know about modern political and social trends today comes out of the Frankfurt School from this environment in Frankfurt. So he creates an educational institute, Jewish Free House of Learning. It becomes a model. He looks at Jews who are strangers. I don't want Jews who know Judaism. You went to Yeshiva, you know what you're doing. You went to, you know, this is for everybody who knows nothing. It's a big midrash for, for assimilated Jews. So they would meet in uh, community buildings, rented halls. It had no precedent in its day. A, there are new ideas about adult education as opposed to academic education. So he said the best way to teach is to have people who know nothing explore Jewish texts and talk to people who know nothing and rediscover, rediscover our Jewish sources. So if I have a rabbi who knows everything, well, he's giving you the answers. Get somebody who doesn't know and explores with you, right? So it is one it goes from life to the Torah. That's what he said. So learning in reverse order, that's what he does. So he hires assimilated Jews, but he looks for very popular figures, people who were highly respected in the German academic milieu. So doctor, famous Dr. Richard Koch, uh, chemist Edward Strauss, Bertha Pappenheim, feminist, of major feminist figure. By the way, she was one of Freud's first patients. Uh, and he freed her from her bounds, and that's why she was able to become a leading feminist. Siegfried Krakauer, cultural critic. Uh, as Agnon was one of his first teachers. Before he became famous, he was one of the teachers there. Gershom Sholem, the father of modern study of Kabbalah. Uh, Alphonse Paquette, right? So this was big. There were 1,000 members participating, 1,000 members. All of Frankfurt had only 30,000 Jews. A very small Jewish community. Houston, Texas has more Jews than that. Frankfurt Jewish community, for all its assimilation, raised, by the way, only a few years before, during the Kishinev pogroms, 1904, that small community of 30,000 Jews raised more money for the refugees, uh, for the victims of the Kishinev pogrom than all of the entire United States that already had a, a million or two million Jews at that time. That's the power of that tiny community in Frankfurt. And that was an assimilated community. Right, amazing. A thousand people then out of 30,000 were coming regularly to study. It was almost half your adult population, something like that. So a, you got some great figures, also some of the, um, or they're coming out of Frankfurt. We won't go into that theory. Some of the modern critical race theory comes out of Frankfurt. Herbert Marcuse comes out of Frankfurt. I've done all these people. If any of you know the hippie days, the SDS, one of the Frankfurt community. So it didn't last very long time, ran only a few years because Rosenzweig got sick. Uh, Buber took it over and continued, and then it was replicated in other places. In the United States, it's come, it found its version in the Havra movement, where Jews would get together, create informal groups, examine, explore Jewish thoughts and identity. Um, Limud LA, I tried that here. Here in a community of 500,000, they could get 500 people, right? There they had 50, 30, they got 1,000. Here out of 500,000, you can get 500. You can see the difference of the communities. So also, translation. Translations are always revolutionary. Every time a Bible was translated into language people would understand, revolutions broke out. William Tyndale, long before King James, translated into English. That's when the English started beheading the, well, they had one beheading, but they, they started overthrowing their, their rulers. Uh, Martin Luther translated into German. All of a sudden, the German princes were on, or on call for their behaviors. Mendelssohn uh, translating Bible into German suddenly opened up German to Yiddish speakers. And now Buber is going to reintroduce the thinking of the Bible to Jews by, in their language, writing the Bible in the cadence of the Bible, of biblical Hebrew as best he can. So you have an example, he did this together with uh, Buber. Uh, you have from Hazino, Kesirim ale deshek, revivim ale esef. In other here you have a repetition. The central word is repeated. The last uh, uh, word in each uh, stanza 
uh, is vocalized. Desha, esif, same vocalization sound, and the k and k. Right, that's the parallel. So Robert Alton, his modern translation, tries following Bulba Rosenzweig, like showers on the green, like cloudbursts on the grass. How can we keep the cadence of the Hebrew? Uh, and here's how their German comes out: shower I'm not going to bother translating that, but you get the idea. Right? How do I get the Bible across in a language that you can understand? You've been trying to do that now with the Bible in English, also in some of the translations. His major work here, the Stern der Lesung, Star of Redemption. Right? There's a photocopy, you see the Magdalene David. So here's the first attempt in a systematic theology using the symbol of the Magdalene David, which is not an ancient Jewish symbol, but it served him very well to understand what is the point of Jewish thought. So you have two opposing triangles. I love it. Jews go one, what does it mean? One goes one way, the other one goes the opposite way, right? Anyway, you cut the mug and David, it's always opposite triangles. Well, he's taking a different route. He says, look, you got one triangle that is God and the universe and the human being. Those are the givens in the universe. Then what's the connection? Creation, the universe is a product of creation. That's between God and the universe. Redempt, revelation is the way God and the human being and understand and discover each other. Finally, redemption is where the human being and the world come into, into play. The human being has a function in bringing the universe together, right? redeeming the universe. So, okay, uh, you understand where the Mug and David comes from. And that's, then his book is a philosophical uh, exploration. So a few quotes, I'll just do the shorter ones. Uh, love brings to life whatever is dead around us. The knowledge of everything knowable is not yet wisdom. Right? You know everything and really not be wise. To found God is not an end, but a beginning. Okay. I'm going to keep away from the more complicated quotes. Fascinating his dealing with ALS. A, I saw some preview for some major TV movie uh, about a woman who is struggling with ALS. And she decides the only dignified route is to end her life. And that seems to be in praise of you're facing difficulty, you just end it. Not from Rosenzweig. He's not suffering from this ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, ami amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Towards the end of his life, he's degenerating, degenerating. He types with his, he signals with his eyes and with his toes, he makes a code. His wife reads the code, types out what he is writing in code, blinking eyes and moving toes. At the very end, it means that he's typing a, twi a twitch at a time for each letter. And then his very last moments, he says, it comes to the point, point of all points which the Lord was truly revealed to me in my sleep, the point of all points for which there is. And then he stops because the doctor walks in, has a conversation with him by the signaling method, and Rosenzweig dies that night. In other words, that he is suffering from this debilitating and degenerative disease does not deny his humanity. It is not the reason for him to give up his humanity. And that instead he uses that to create. So the lesson for us all, as we go through life, there are horrible things in life. Yes, anybody who has been through what you have been through understand. You can let that crush you, or you can go all the way to the very end. And that's what Rosenzweig was teaching us. So he was buried, there was no eulogy. Buber read though at the cemetery, Psalm 73. And I'll show you that. And he has this quote, another quote, nothing Jewish is alien to me. Next Yiddish is my near friend. Nothing Jewish is alien to me. In other words, as a Jew, I explore everything that has ever been said, written by anybody Jewish. I'm exposed to it. This is his, uh, the memorial plaque on his house. And it says, he was the trailblazer of the Jewish Christian dialogue, companion of Martin Buber, master of the translation of German into the Bible, founder of the Free Jewish Academy in Frankfurt AM, and the quotation, thus I am always with you. Since the human being is never, even at the last minute of death, abandoned by God in that, in that feeling. So I'm gonna, just show you this last quote, uh, not a quote, but a 
visual, and we're going to wrap it up. What is the point? I just want to say this. There was a great outburst of creativity, Jewish identity, and Jewish life. Who knows what would have happened had Hitler not come to power? Out of this little community, 30,000 Jews, what was going on? And then similarly in Berlin, similarly in the Vienna and so on. This outburst of Jewish creativity. Who knows what would have happened? See what Hitler destroyed for the world. For the world. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go on down. Wait one second. Go ahead. Uh, and there's no interest in that. Judaism is Judaism. It's uh, it's as he believes. No, no, it's not completely orthodox. But his one one of his teachers, the great orthodox rabbi of Frankfurt, Rabbi Nehemia Nobel. Right. So it's if nothing is alien to me as a Jew, I want to explore. I'm up to opening. So here, this is as I say. Catholic University, how they have a take on Rosenzweig explaining his thinking. And it's very difficult. You have to understand German philosophy of the 20th century, 19th century, but still very good. Go ahead. Let's see, is the sound coming up? Sound, sound, sound. Are we on screen share? Still on screen share. Where's my volume? Where's my volume? Maybe I need my volume. Is it coming across? Okay, let's try this. Go from your end. Okay, I'm going to stop screen share. Take it from your end. That's it. Okay. It's the last one. Of this. That's it. That's it. My technician saved the day. I'm going to wrap with this. Okay, the last one, right? So skip forward. Oh, we have this. Yeah, let's see. There we go. Screen share. Franz Rosenzweig is one of the most original contemporary philosophers, and he contributed to a neo Hegelian revival in Germany. After the traumatic experience of World War I, he elaborated an anti-totalitarian new thinking. His account of revelation as a call from the absolute other and his co-existentialist approach helped to shape the course of 20th century philosophy and theology. His reflections on finitude and the temporal contours of human experience made a deep impact on 20th century humanistic studies. His presentation of dialogue as an interpersonal relationship between I and you is held as constitutive of selfhood and community. In his own words, he points out that each person has two names, a family name and a proper name. We are the result of our inheritance and of our future. Hegel's view of thinking and being prevents the structural and unifying power of revelation and turns man into a mere tool of totality. Kierkegaard, and not only he, contested the Hegelian integration of revelation into the all. The point in question is Soren Kierkegaard's own consciousness of personal sin and of personal redemption which neither aspired to, nor gave access to, a dissolution into the cosmos. Schopenhauer was the first among the great thinkers to be concerned, not with the essence, but with the value of the world. Now, facing this knowable world, there rose another independent reality, the living human being, before the all, there rose the one 
who mocked all totality and all universality. Yet here there arrived a man who knew his life and his soul like a poet and obeyed their voice like a saint, and yet he was a philosopher. Man, in the simple oneness of his own being, strode out of the world that knew itself as a thinkable world, strode out of the all of philosophy. He who questions the totality of being, as is the case here, refutes the unity of thinking. He who does this, throws the gauntlet to the whole venerable brotherhood of philosophers from Ionia to Gina. Our time has done this. The STAR is a system of philosophy that seeks to give a comprehensive and ramified account of all that is and of the human being's place within that all. It is a system in which revelation plays a vital conceptual and methodological role and in which Judaism and Christianity are claimed to offer glimpses of the redemptive unity of the all which the philosopher seeks to know. The womb of the inexhaustible earth ceaselessly gives birth to what is new, and each one is subject to death. Each newly born waits with fear and trembling for the day of its passage into the dark. But philosophy refutes these earthly fears. Even from out of the fog with which philosophy envelops it, its harsh cry resounds unremittingly. Philosophy would have liked to swallow it into the night of the nothing, but it could not break off its poisonous sting. And the fear man feels, trembling before this sting, always cruelly belies the compassionate lie of philosophy. If philosophy did not want to stop its ears before the cry of frightened humanity, it would have had to take the following as its point of departure. The nothing of death is a something. Each renewed nothing of death is a new something that frightens anew and that cannot be passed over in silence, nor be silenced. Metaphysic. The meta-ethical concept of man is not exhausted by the fact that he has his own ethos in him. The metalogical concept of the world is not exhausted by the fact that it has his own logos in it. Likewise, the metaphysical of God is just as little exhausted by the fact that God has his own nature. Metalogic. The world is logical as it exists according to the laws of nature. Yet the world's existence transcends all logic as it is the outcome of an act of pure love and is therefore metalogical. Metaethic. Philosophy had thought it could take hold of man, including man as personality and ethics, but that was an impossible aspiration. Facing the view of the world, the view of life demands recognition. Ethics is and remains a part of the view of the world. These concepts, metaphysics, metalogic, and meta-ethics point out that life is bigger than thought and that man must willingly accept his vocation to do justice and to be good with all his heart and to walk humbly with his God. With creation of world and man by God, man knows life and comes to term with his finitude and mortality. With the dialogue of revelation between God and man, man understands that as strong as death is love. 
It falls upon man to lead the world and all within it to redemption. Because love is stronger than death. Because love is life. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 very very heavy, heavy, very heavy, very heavy mm -hmm. thinking, right? Um, it's nothing that you can do on one foot. You need the introduction to the whole idea of philosophy and then the revolution against philosophy and contemporary thought. We're not going to go into that, but you can see how a thinker like that had such an impact in the Jewish community and uh, till today. As I say, we don't know the name so well. But the impact is there. Uh, and so let's all, I wish all of us a Shabbat Shalom. Gonna, next week, we're going to examine another Jewish thinker, Kaplan, completely the opposite. Completely the opposite. That's what I love about Jewish thought. Always, always, all opposites. And then uh, we're coming into Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. All right. We're going to have a few hearty souls in here. And then the rest are going to be online through Zoom. So everybody, please get to make your arrangements. And we wish you.